as we've been looking at the home front during World War II, uh, we cannot ignore the issue of Japanese internment. So that's what we're gonna be spending um, this lecture looking at. There's also a TED talk you're gonna watch about Japanese internment um, and a reading that you're gonna do as well. It's definitely a dark cloud in our country's history. Um, something that we might look back on and definitely think this is a struggle for us, um, which is why it's uh, that much more important that we learn about it, right, to prevent something like this from ever happening again. So when we look at Japanese internment, and really when we look at things in our history, one thing we want to really ask ourselves is, you know, well, why would something happen, right? What uh, things had to be aligned to make something be able to happen at that time, right? And so the major event that we're looking at here with Japanese internment is the attack on Pearl Harbor and the sentiment towards the Japanese people after the Empire of Japan had attacked the United States. People became very fearful of Japanese people. Uh, they became angry with them and also full of resentment because of the attack at Pearl Harbor. So the other thing that we've looked at this semester um, quite often is fear. Right, so not only were people angry um, at Japan and you know full of resentment as well uh, because of Pearl Harbor, but Americans were also fearful. Right, they were afraid of the Japanese government and what they might do next. And what happens when people feel that sense of fear is they might behave or react in a way that they would not uh, do if they did not feel that fear. So if we look at America's response um, to the attack of Pearl Harbor. Again, you've got that fear and hostility towards the Japanese people. In February of 1942, remember Pearl Harbor was attacked in December of 41, but in February of 1942, an executive order was passed. An executive order is an order that comes directly from the president. All right, it does not have to go through Congress, but Executive Order 9066. And what that executive order did was established military areas along the West Coast. The idea being that if uh, Japan had attacked us already at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, the next natural location that they might attack us then would be the continental United States along the West Coast. And so FDR as the president um, issued this executive order that established those military areas along the West Coast. A couple months later then, in April of 1942, the Civilian Exclusion Order number 27 was passed. And what that stated was that all people of Japanese ancestry were now excluded from the West Coast, because those were military areas. If you were of Japanese ancestry, you were not allowed to live there. We're not just talking about um, you know Japanese citizens that were in the United States. We are actually talking about Japanese Americans, people that had citizenship within the United States, people that were uh, born in the United States, right? These are Japanese Americans um, that were removed from the West Coast. When you look at the impact of the civilian exclusion order, um, at least at that time or during those moments, you can see that over 100,000 lives were impacted, right? They really did not have a lot of time to pack up. Uh, the United States military would show up at their house. And again, these are Japanese Americans, so people who have you know, rights and, and liberties as American citizens. But our military would go knock on the door, basically tell them you know, that they have enough time to grab uh, whatever they can in their hand, and that was it. And then they removed them from their homes and brought them to live in these internment camps. As you can see from this picture, and at the end of the slide, you'll look at a few other pictures. These were literally camps that were fenced in. They were in areas um, of the desert where they set up tents for them to stay in, but actually had these people uh, fenced in. Many of them, of course, had to leave most of their belongings behind, their jobs behind, and their lives behind. The overall goal of the United States during this time was to isolate the Japanese people and people of Japanese ancestry in order to watch all of them at one time, right? Again, out of that fear that who knows what the Empire of Japan is gonna do next. And is there a possibility that there are Japanese spies living amongst us? So if our government was knowingly and willingly taking American citizens, right, those of Japanese ancestry and putting them into these internment camps, you know, we wanna ask the question, why? why why would they? We know why, right? Because they're fearful, but how do they justify it? How did they go to bed at night feeling good about what they were doing? And so we're going to look at this justification side. Uh, number one, they believe that it was really hard to distinguish between the Japanese people, you know, who was a friend and who was an enemy, right? We had no idea. Um, again, 
They were worried about another attack on the United States, this time it would be in the continental United States, and were worried, what if some of these Japanese Americans uh, were spies and actually working for the Japanese government? Another justification that they used was the idea of Shintoism. So this is a, um, a traditional Japanese belief. And with the traditional Japanese belief, they worship their emperor as a supreme being. And so the fear with Shintoism was the idea that even though these people had been living in the United States for you know, decades, for a very long time, that they may still feel this pull of loyalty towards Japan and the Japanese emperor. So as we're going through this, and as you're thinking about Japanese internment, I want you to think about this is a struggle for our country. We've talked about our American values all semester, and this goes directly against those values, right? Values like freedom, and equality, and justice. But again, this is all led out of fear. And again, that's just another thing that we've talked about this semester, how fear leads us to do things that we might not normally do. The next few slides are just gonna be a series of photos um, that were taken during this time, uh, just to kind of really give us an idea of what Japanese internment looked at. So these are the notices that would have been posted for people to uh, be aware that these were now turned into uh, military areas. Here's a photo of a family with their belongings. As I mentioned before, uh, members of the US military would stop at homes of Japanese Americans and basically tell them to gather up everything that they can and everything that they can carry. So here's an example of that. Here's a photo of the living quarters. Um, you're also gonna read about the living quarters as well in the article, Home was a Horse Stall. So that's gonna be one of the assignments here after the slideshow. This is a photo of children in these internment camps. So again, it wasn't just adults, right? It was entire families that they picked up, um, removing them from their houses and bringing them to these internment camps. So this is a picture of school happening for some of these children. I think out of all of the photos um, that we've already looked at and the ones that we'll continue to look at, this one just really stands out to me um, just because of the irony in it. So here you have an internment camp. Um, again, you can see it was a very desolate area where they moved these people to. Um, and right in the front of the picture, you have an American flag that's flying, right? And what is that flag supposed to represent? Right, it represents our values, right? The liberties, freedoms um, that we have and justice and equality and diversity. So if those are all the things that the flag represents, it's rather ironic in this photo um, that it's within this internment camp. Here's another photo that just kind of shows the fencing that went along these internment camps uh, as well. Some of these people were let out of camps to go um, to work certain jobs. Uh, those jobs would actually help with the war and help to support the war effort. But then when they were returned home, they returned to these internment camps. This is just an example of a family um, that's uh, arriving at the internment camps. As previously mentioned, um, these people would be working uh, towards the war efforts and also growing food as well to help support those that are in the internment camps. And so what they did in these uh, desert areas is they helped to irrigate those areas and then turn them into farms to help uh, provide food, not only for the war effort, but also for those living in the internment camps as well. 